Hello, welcome to this lesson looking at potential dividers. In this lesson, we're going to focus on how to understand how a potential divider works. Now, this lesson is part of the AQA A level physics uh, specification focusing on electricity. Now, in today's lesson, we're going to focus on what potential dividers are in circuits, how potential dividers work in circuits, and then how you could possibly calculate electrical values in your potential divider circuits, which links into the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification. So in this part of the specification, you've got to be able to define what a potential divider is and investigate the behavior of a potential divider circuit, and then look at different examples of things in a potential divider circuit, such as a variable resistor, a thermistor, and an LDR. Now, to understand how a potential divider works, you've really got to remember what Kirchhoff's second law of electrical circuits is. So, to start us off in this lesson, we'll just recap our understanding based on this. Now, Kirchhoff's second law states how energy is conserved in an electrical circuit. Now, we looked at this at GCSE because you knew in GCSE, in a series circuit, the EMF into the circuit equals the PD out of the circuit. Now, you can't call this Kirchhoff's voltage law, the second law, the closed circuit law, or the loop law. Now, again, like we said before, it's based on energy conservation. In the idea that in a closed loop or in a closed circuit, okay, the energy cannot be created. It cannot be destroyed, it can only be transferred. So the algebraic sum of the potential differences in any loop must equal zero. So we can actually have a complex circuit which has many loops or many paths. We can divide them into many different closed circuits or paths and use Kirchhoff's second law to understand what's going on. Now, just to clarify what is actually going on again, any source of EMF is a potential rise in the circuit because energy per charge is being placed into the circuit. So all of these components, such as cells, power packs and batteries, place energy per charge into the circuit. They all cause the potential in the circuit to rise. But you've also got transducers or potential droppers in a circuit. These are outputs in your circuit which will cause energy to leave the electrical circuit. So you've got things like bulbs and motors and heaters. So they all take energy out of the circuit. So they will cause the potential to drop in the circuit. So in one closed electrical loop, there are potential risers and there are potential droppers. Now again, like we mentioned before, we can consider one electrical loop as one closed circuit where energy can't be created, it can't be destroyed. So in this particular path, the total EMF provided by the potential risers has to equal the total PD out, which is occurring in the potential droppers. Now, again, they don't actually have to split this potential difference equally. That will only occur when each device has the same resistance, because the potential difference across a device is directly proportional to the resistance of that particular device. So in this example, on the screen in front of us, the bulb on the left-hand side has double the resistance of the bulb on the right-hand side, so therefore it will take double the potential difference, but the two values of the bulb added up must equal the EMF of the power source. And again, in this particular example, okay, the bulb on the left has three times as much resistance as the bulb on the right, so we'll take three times as much potential difference as the bulb on the right, but the two numbers added together have to equal the EMF provided by the cell, which in this example is 12 volts. Now, to work out how this split would be, as a bit of a maths tip, you work out the proportion of resistance found on each side, then use that to find the split. So, for example, you would work out the total resistance. So, in this case, it would be 30 plus 10, which is 40 ohms. You then find the proportion each output will take. So the bulb on the left will take 30 out of 40, or 3 quarters, and the bulb on the right will take 10 out of 40, or 1 quarter. You then, to find the potential difference in each output, multiply the EMF by the proportion at each output. So, for example, the bulb on the left, as we knew it took 3 quarters of the resistance, you do the EMF, which is 12, times by 3 quarters, giving you a value of 9. 
Okay, now just to have a logic check, the EMF in should always equal the PD out in one loop, and the higher the resistance of the output, the higher the potential difference. So, number one, the two values added up will sum to equal the EMF of the source, and the, the value on the left is as three times as much resistance, so as three times as much potential difference. Now, again, just remember that this is only true for a DC circuit and not an AC circuit like a transformer. Now, obviously, we can take these, these laws and apply them to different contexts. So the first idea is we assume that for two or more components in series, the total potential of difference across the components is equal to the sum of the potential differences across each component. So we're assuming here there's no internal resistance, so V source is equal to V1 plus V2. Now this shows us that we are assuming under these laws that no energy is lost in your circuit except on the wanted output devices, in this case two bulbs. The second part is that the potential difference across components in parallel is the same. That's because each loop is considered a different closed system and the loops are supplied with identical amounts of energy per charge from the EMS source. So the more loops connected to a source, the more, to the more energy supplied by that particular source. So in the case of a battery, it would make it drain faster. In the case of a power pack, it would just be taking more energy from the mains. And finally, part three, for any complete loop, the sum of EMF is equal to the sum of the potential drop around the loop. Okay, and the EMF is divided into different potential differences, and we call this particular type of circuit a potential divider, which is all we're going to focus on in this particular lesson. So a potential divider is achieved if you've got more than one potential difference output in your electrical loop. Now, like we mentioned before, again, the potential difference does not have to split equally. It splits in direct proportion to the resistances. So the greater the resistance, the greater the potential difference an output will take. So the resistance and the potential difference will change with each other directly. So just to clarify, before we move on to focusing on potential differences, uh, dividers, my apologies, what are the three parts of Kirchhoff's second law? Part 1, for two or more components in series, the total potential difference across the components is equal to the sum of the potential differences across each component. Part 2, the potential difference across a component in parallel will be the same. And that for any complete loop of a circuit, the sum of EMF into the circuit is equal to the sum of potential differences out of the circuit. Now, we can use the, that particular law to produce an important type of electrical circuit. So, like we mentioned before, if you have two or more outputs in series with each other on the same electrical path, on the same electrical loop, the potential difference will split okay, from the source between those outputs. So, we call these outputs transducers, and this type of circuit is a potential divider. Why is it called a potential divider? Well, it is it's called a potential divider because you are literally dividing the potential, the energy, provided from the source between more than one output. So fundamentally, a potential divider is produced when there is more than one output found in a series electrical circuit or in a single loop or a single path. So in these circuits, the overall potential difference out has been split between the different outputs. Okay, so the EMF supply is being split between your different outputs. Now, therefore, you will need at least two transducers, whether that be bulbs, resistors, LDRs, thermistors, variable resistors, okay, and a voltage source, like a power pack or a cell or a battery, to be a circuit. Now, the potential difference across one of the resistors is going to be defined as the useful output voltage for the circuit. And if the resistors are not fixed, this will provide a circuit which is given a variable useful output voltage, which can be used in things like dimmer switches, for example. So we're going to focus on the mathematics behind a potential divider electrical circuit. So just to clarify, from the previous Kirchhoff's laws, we can state that the total energy inputted per charge into the loop must equal the total energy per charge out of the loop. So total EMF in equals total PD out. Now, this type of circuit diagram we, you've used 
in GCSE and Key Stage 3 because it's, it's a format that allows us to show current flow easily. So current will, will begin at one terminal, move around the circuit and terminate at the other terminal. However, in, this, in these potential divider circuits, we're not focusing too much on the current flow, we're focusing on the potential difference slash EMF. So it's actually easier to draw these circuits in another format. Okay, so we can write it in this particular format. So it's just the same circuit, it's two bulbs in series with the voltage source, okay, but instead of drawing it as a loop, which can easily show current in a circuit, we can draw a circuit in terms of rails, which allows us to see an energy transfer in the circuit. Now, each rail in the circuit has a different potential difference or potential level associated with it. So, for example, the top rail could have a potential of 10 volts and the bottom rail could have a potential of 0 volts. Now, this notation is used to easily express the potential difference or the potential change in an electrical circuit. Now, both notations, both the loop and the rail notation, can be used in drawing your electrical circuits, use the um, use the rail notation when you want to consider the potential differences, and then use the loop notation when you want to consider the current flow. Now we will always consider the rail at the top to be the input EMF. This is the EMF of the source. So, for example, if you set your power pack to 12 volts, the value on the top rail would be 12 volts. So it shows the potential rises in the circuit, whilst so it shows the energy per charge entering the circuit. Now the bottom rail is the potential difference at the end of the circuit. Now it's after the potential droppers have been in the circuit. Now we will consider this to be zero as all of the energy has been transferred out of the circuit because like we said before, total EMF in equals total PD out. So as a result, all of the energy per charge has been transferred out of the circuit. So in this notation, we could put 12 volts on the top and 0 volts on the bottom rail. Now, rails are drawn in between each output in the circuit, and the difference between two rails shows your potential difference of that particular output on that rail. So you can see here, the difference between the top rail and the middle rail will be the potential difference of output 1. Now, this can be done as each output transfers energy per charge out of the circuit, changing the potential difference in the circuit. Now, as, we, as mentioned before, this is only true for outputs in series circuits. So in this notation again, output 1 and output 2 are in a series circuit. Now, if outputs are found on the same rail, they must be parallel. So in this notation, output 2 and 3 are in parallel with each other, but they're in series with output 1. We know output 2 and output 3 are in parallel because they are drawn on the same rail. Now this makes sense because you've learned this previously, that outputs in parallel have the same potential difference, so it makes sense to draw them on the same rail because each rail has the same potential difference. So to clarify, the difference in the top rail and the middle rail drawn is the output potential difference for output 1, but the, the difference between the middle rail and the bottom rail is the output potential difference for output 2. Now we've learned this before from Kirchhoff's laws that EMF into the circuit equals PD out of the circuit, so V in must equal V1 plus V2. Now, in this notation, we tend to state that the lower output rail is the useful output of the circuit. So in this notation, V2 will be the useful output voltage and V1 will be the wasted output voltage. Now, in electrical engineering, we can call the useful output the output of the electrical circuit. So we give it the notation V out. So in theory now, V in equals V1 plus V out. Now, as we mentioned before, okay, because it's a DC electrical circuit, Kirchhoff's laws still apply, so the potential difference of V1 and V out will be split in proportion to their resistances. So, for example, if V1 has double the resistance of V out, 
the therefore it will take double the potential difference but the two numbers will still have to add to get v in and in this example v out has three times as much uh, resistance so we'll have three times as potential difference as v1 but the two numbers must still add up to equal v in and in this example uh, v out has four times as much resistance than v1 so we'll take four times as much potential difference as v1 but the two numbers still have to add up to equal the total emf in so this shows us that in a potential divider circuit the greater the resistance over the useful output the greater the potential difference of the useful output so it increases the efficiency of the electrical circuit because more of the energy more of the voltage is going to the useful output as opposed to the wasted output now we can use a potential divider to achieve either a useful output of zero or an e or the emf value in an electrical circuit because if the resistance of the useful is much, 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 much larger than the resistance of the wasted output, then it's going to take nearly all of the EMF from the circuit. So therefore, because it's got most of the resistance, it will gain most of the EMF, so it can approximate V out to be the EMF. But th that makes the circuit very efficient. But on the converse... Okay, if R1, if the resistance of the wasted output was much, 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 much larger than the uh, resistance of the useful output, then basically none of the resistance can be found on the useful, so we'll gain none of the EMF, so we can approximate V out in this example to be 0 volts. So that makes the circuit have a very low efficiency. Now, Remember, okay, as there is always a wasted output, the PD will always be smaller than the EMF for the useful output. So the wasted output will always have some proportion of the resistance, so we'll always have some proportion of the EMF. So you're never truly going to ever get 100% efficiency in a potential divider circuit. Now we can express this mathematically by using the equation, which is known as the potential divider equation, which is V out, which is the useful output voltage, is V in, the EMF of the source, times by R2 over R1 plus R2. Fundamentally, it times in the EMF by the proportion of the useful resistance compared to the total resistance. So that is the potential divider equation, which is used to calculate the output voltage of your circuit, which can sometimes be referred to as the load voltage or the output of the circuit, or sometimes in engineering can also be referred to as the top and off voltage. Now, just to remind you, this equation is given to you in examination books. However, you need to know the context behind what it's working out and where it will be used. Now, we call it sometimes the top and off voltage because the voltage is being tapped off for a useful purpose. Now V out will always be a fraction of V in, so your useful potential difference out will never be as large as the EMF as value going in, and the magnitude of V out is dependent on the ratios of your resistances of your outputs. Now there will always be some energy dissipated due to resistance in your electrical circuit. So just to clarify this again, V out is equal to V in times by R2 over R1 plus R2. Now, a potentiometer is a variable resistor that can act as a potential divider in a circuit. Now, a potentiometer is basically a resistor which has three electrical connectors in the circuit. So it's got to be placed in parallel when you place it in your electrical circuit. Now, it can be altered to give a maximum value or a zero value. Now, again, how that is determined is by the position of the third connector in the potentiometer. Because the potentiometer, fundamentally, is like a variable resistor instead of two resistors in series. So, things like dimmer switches and the volume control on digital radios tend to be potentiometers. So it's similar to what was happening before, that the position of the central connector on your potentiometer determines the value of the wasted output and the value of the useful output. Because like we mentioned before, okay, the um, potential difference on the useful and the output is determined by the resistances of each part of those circuits. So, if the, the connector in a potentiometer 
can make it act as two output devices and the position of the connector can determine the split between useful and wasted. So the lower down the connector, the less useful output there is because less of the resistance of your potentiometer is dedicated to the useful output, more is dedicated to the waste output, so the waste output would take more of the potential differences. So if you put your potentiometer in a circuit and you put the connector all the way to the bottom of the potentiometer, well then there'd be no useful output because all of the resistance would be used on the wasted output, so as a result you're getting zero volts as the useful voltage out, so that's how a potentiometer can achieve zero volts when taking a measurement in an electrical circuit. But on the converse, if you place the connector at the top of the potentiometer, none of the resistance is being used for the wasted output, so all of the resistance being used for the useful output, so the out is in fact the EMF of the source, so therefore the potentiometer can achieve the complete EMF value in the circuit. Now, finally, one other use we can have for a potential divider is to carry out something called loading a potential divider. Now, loading a potential divider is when you place outputs in parallel on the useful branch. Now, remember, uh, when you put things on the same rail, okay, that means they are in parallel. So, in this example, R2 and R3 are in parallel with each other because they're on the same rail. Now, Remember, okay, that the greater the number of useful outputs in parallel, the more loaded a potential divider is. But let's take this through to its fundamental conclusion, because we know that the potential difference across the useful and the wasted outputs is determined by the resistances of those particular rails or outputs. So, if we put devices in parallel with each other, we can work out the equivalent resistance of the output rail using the parallel resistors equation covered earlier in the course. But if you fundamentally remember, the output, uh, the parallel resistors equation is 1 over R total equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over Rn, okay, until you, you reach how many uh, resistors you've got in parallel. Now, when you add a resistors in parallel, the equivalent resistance decreases. The equivalent resistance decreases because there are more paths for the mobile charge carriers to flow down, so there's less chance of a collision lowering your equivalent resistance. So when you load a potential divider, you place more outputs on, on, the, on, the, output, on the useful rail as a parallel, so the resistance of the useful output rail will go down, so what that means is, because resistance and potential difference is directly proportional, that if the resistance of the rail has gone down, well, the potential difference of the rail will go down. So therefore, there is less potential difference being dedicated to the useful output of the circuit. So when you load your uh, potential divider, there'll be a lower equivalent resistance across the rail, meaning V out will decrease because the resistance and PD are in direct proportion. So the more devices in the output, the more loaded the potential divider, the lower the useful output potential difference, the lower the tapping off voltage, the lower the efficiency of the device. Now, obviously, this trend only occurs if the two... Uh, resist the two outputs in parallel have approximately the same resistance. So in this example, if R2 and R3 are approximately the same, if one of the outputs has a much smaller resistance, well, that value will dominate the equivalent resistance because, as you know, in parallel, the equivalent resistance must be smaller than the smallest individual resistor. So, therefore, it will dominate. So, that's because the addition of 1 over R will be a small effect if 1R is much larger than the other R. So, for example, doing 1 over 100 plus 1 over 10, well, 1 over 100 is going to be a small factor when you're working it through because it's a much smaller number. So... With that particular idea, we've covered all these concepts in potential dividers for today's lesson. So hopefully, we can look at what potential dividers are in electrical circuits, 
we can understand how potential dividers work in electrical circuits, and we can understand how to calculate electrical values U from potential divider circuits. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson of potential dividers, and in a future lesson we will look at applications of potential dividers when considering LDRs and thermistors. Have a lovely day everyone, and stay safe.